we need to talk about what it means and how we respond when we feel anger towards God. And it's, it's going to happen as much as we might like to think that we're above that. We are mortals and we live in a fallen world and things aren't going to go always according to plan or the way that we expect them to. And there are going to be times when there's going to be a lot of disconnect between what we read in God's Word and what we experience in real life. And we are going to get frustrated with God. And so the question is, how do we respond to that? How do we manage it? What is the right thing to do in those circumstances? So today we're going to look at the book of Job. We're going to read the first chapter, and we're going to go from there. There's other passages that I'll that I'll refer to, those will be on the screen. But let's read the first chapter. In the land of Uz, there lived a man named, whose name was Job. And this man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters. And he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabians attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head, then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. I'll stop there for a minute. In the next chapter there, Satan comes back and says, well, you haven't touched Job at all. Maybe, maybe if you touch, touch the man himself, then, then he'll curse you to your face. And God said, okay, but you have to spare his life. So then Job is covered with these terrible, awful sores. So awful that he's scratching himself constantly because of the pain and the discomfort. And then from the rest of the book on, it's, it's Job speaking and three friends that come to comfort him. And they're speaking back and forth together. And Job is this major piece of, of poetry. It's, it's an amazing story. I really like the story a lot because there's a lot of depth here that you can find new things every time you read it. But when it comes to anger with God, that's kind of what we're going to 
narrow in on here. Job is a lesson in both anger done well and anger not done well. There's good things that we can learn from Job and how to be angry with God. And there's also warnings that we can take about, okay, this is how not to be angry with God. We can learn both. Now, per last week, in the sermon last week, Job's anger towards God drives him towards God. He pursues God. He's talking to God in a lot of these dialogues here. Many of his words are towards God, even as he's talking with his friends. And if you read through everything that Job has to say, as well as these friends, Job definitely knows God's sovereign power. He's very acquainted with God's strength, his omnipotence, his omniscience, and his omnipresence. He knows and respects God. He has a good sense of who God is. There's a few verses here that I want to put in front of you. Job 12, 13, and 14. To God belong wisdom and power. Counsel and understanding are his. What he tears down cannot be rebuilt. The man he imprisons cannot be released. God's power and authority is final. Job 12.10, in his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. God holds our, our very life. And Job 28.28, 28, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to shun evil is understanding. Job has a very solid foundation on, on who God is. But one thing that you will notice if you read through the book of Job is how often Job places the blame on God for all that he's going through. In fact, Job is rather ruthless in accusing God of being the source of his suffering. And when I was looking for passages here, I, got, I have too many of them to put all on the screen here. Job blames God for what he's going through. This is, this is what God has done to me. And I have a number of passages that I'm going to put on here. I have more that I didn't put up here, but Job 6, verse 4. The arrows of the Almighty are in me. My spirit drinks in their poison. God's terrors are marshaled against me. The arrows of the Almighty are in me. In other words, God just shot me with a bow and arrow, a poison-tipped arrow at that. Job seven seventeen. What is man that you make so much of him, that you give him so much attention, that you examine him every morning and test him at every moment? Will you never look away from me or let me alone, even for an instant? If I have sinned, what have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you made me your target? Have I become a burden to you? You've targeted me. Why are you doing this? Job 10, 2 through 8, or... Um, Three through eight, actually. Does it please you to oppress me, to spurn the work of your hands, while you smile on the schemes of the wicked? Do you have eyes of flesh? Do you see as a mortal sees? Your hands shaped me and made me. Will you now turn and destroy me? This is God at work here. Job 16. God assails me and tears me in his anger and gnashes his teeth at me. My opponent that's God, fastens on me his piercing eyes. God has turned me over to evil men and thrown me into the clutches of the wicked. All was well with me, but he shattered me. He seized me by the neck and crushed me. He has made me his target. His archers surround me. Without pity, he pierces my kidneys and spills my gall on the ground. Again and again, he bursts upon me. He rushes at me like a warrior. One more. It's, it's all over this book here. Job 30. In his great power, God becomes like clothing to me. He binds me like the neck of my garment. He throws me to the mud, and I am reduced to dust and ashes. I cry out to you, O God, but you do not answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. You turn on me ruthlessly. With the might of your hand, you attack me. You snatch me up and drive me before the wind. You toss me about in the storm. This is, he's talking about God here. This is God who has done this to him. All throughout this book, I got more here that are not on the screen. 
Throughout the book, Job is saying, God, you are doing this to me. Why are you doing this to me? And he gets very graphic even. Now we as readers of the story, we know that Satan is the instigator. But Job never mentions Satan at all. Not even once in the book. Satan is completely off Job's radar. We know what's actually going on, but as far as Job is concerned, he's saying, this is, a, this is all God doing this to me. God is, God is sovereign in all of this, and this book definitely reveals that. God is sovereign. God gave the green light to all of this. God has Satan on a leash, and God decides how long that leash is going to be. And so, God is the one to deal with. I really, I really actually kind of like this, because this to me is kind of like the ultimate forget you to Satan. You know, I'm not even going to bother with Satan. I'm going to go right to the source. Satan, Satan's almost irrelevant to me. I'm going to focus on God and my relationship with God even when these things are happening to me. By contrast, Job's friends, throughout the book, they defend God. And they say, no, you can't say that about God. God does good things to good people, and he punishes bad people. You can't just put this on God like that. God does good to good people and bad to bad people. That's how God works. And what they're basically implying is that you must have done something wrong because bad things are happening to you and only bad things happen to bad people. So you, must, you should repent or something. Job does go too far, though. At the very beginning, or what we just read, the last verse there, it says, In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. But later on, he does make some charges that God is unjust. In Job 19, it says this, If indeed you would exalt yourself, he's talking to your friend, his friends, above me and use my humiliation against me, then know that God has wronged me and drawn his net around me. Though I cry, I've been wronged. I get no response Though I call for help, there is no justice. So here, Job goes too far. There is no justice. There's one other verse, Job 27. As surely as God lives, who has denied me justice? And later on, he seems to kind of like subpoena God in court. There's one verse where he says, Oh, that I had someone to hear me. I sign now my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing. Kind of like, God, I, I'm taking you to court because this is not right. At the very end of the book, God rebukes Job for discrediting divine justice. God rebukes Job for those, those things that he said. Job 40, verse 8. God, God has a lot of words here, but there's one key verse that he says here. Job 40, I think I put that on the screen there. Did I put that? There it is. <laughs> Job 40, verse 8. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? In other words, you're going to tell me that I'm in the wrong? Who, who are you? That's mostly God's point in these last chapters. It, who's God here? Who, who knows what's best here? Who's, who's in the right? So Job has no place to charge God with wrongdoing. God knows what's going on more than anyone else. And so at the end, Job repents. In Job 42 I think I have that up here. He says, Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, Listen now and I will speak. I will question you and you will answer me. 
My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. God appears to Job very gloriously and magnificently. And now, he says, now my eyes have seen you. I'd only heard about you before. God rebuked Job for this, but he did not condemn Job. He rebuked, but did not condemn Job. He, did, he opens about Job saying, Who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? But God did not condemn Job. He condemns the friends. By contrast, God's anger burns against the friends. With Job, all right, I got to set you straight here a little bit. With these friends, you got to be kidding me. God is angry with the friends. He corrects Job, but to the friends, his anger burns, it says. Job 42, verse 7. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. And that gets repeated again. You have not spoken to me what is right, like Job did. Unlike Job's friends, God himself says, Job, he had good theology. You guys, no. Job, he had good theology. I had to, I had to correct him, of course, but for the most part, he was, he was there. He was right. You guys, no. In other words, God was behind his suffering Look at the screen here. Let's answer this. How does the knowledge of God's creation and providence help us? We can be patient when things go against us, thankful when things go well. And for the future, we can have good confidence in our faithful God and Father that nothing will separate us from His love. All creatures are so completely in his hand that without his will, they can neither move nor be moved. God is all-powerful. He's in control of all things. Even if he doesn't actively cause things to happen, he makes the call of what happens and what doesn't. Because God is sovereign... He is behind even our suffering. We would like to think that God just wants us to be happy, healthy, wealthy, and to feel good all the time. But if you read the Bible, this is not God's MO. God is not just about us feeling good. Suffering is definitely not God's original design, but it is part of His plan. In Isaiah 53, it says of Christ, It was the Lord's will to crush Him and cause Him to suffer. In Acts 2, talking about Jesus, This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? This, was, this is in the plan. And so, reflecting on Job and looking at what he said and looking at how God responded to him, it's not wrong to go after God for our sufferings. Job spends a lot of time chasing God and going after Him because of what he's suffering. God doesn't rebuke him for that. And at the end he says, Job spoke of me what is right. Job placed the blame for all his troubles on God. He wasn't rebuked for it. He wasn't rebuked for that. And in this we can learn that God, God is a person 
God's not a force. He's not a principle. Treat God like a person. He's our Father. In our suffering, pursue God. This is what Job does. He's suffering. He's miserable. And you can see why. In our anger, we need to pursue God. Go after Him. Talk to Him. Relate to Him. Wrestle with Him, as it's said at times, like Jacob did at Peniel. When you're angry with God, talk to Him. Tell Him you're angry. Get to know Him. Grow in faith because of it. So it's, God is sovereign. So He is even behind our suffering. But because God is holy, it is wrong to say that God is wrong or unjust. We can't go that far. We can be upset with God for what He's allowing to happen, for what is happening in our life, the suffering that we have. But we cannot say that God is wrong. We cannot say that God is unjust. That is, that's too far. God is always just. He is always true and always right. And if there's any injustice in this world, it's really against Him and against Jesus Christ who had to die for our sins even though He was sinless. So in rage, be respectful. Job spends a lot of time raging against God. But be respectful. Remember who God is. God knows a whole lot more than we do, and He loves us a whole lot more than we even love ourselves. God does know what He's doing. As hard as it might be to believe at times, He does know what He's doing, and with His people, He wants the best for us. And that, whatever, in spite of whatever appearances or what it might seem, that, that's the actual truth. So when you're raging against God, as you will at times, be respectful. Still remember who God is and who He is. In this fallen world, things are not the way they're supposed to be. There's a lot of things that are going to happen here that are not the way that they're supposed to be. Not the way that it was originally designed, at least. It says that Jesus is king of all things. And yet in Hebrews 2.8, it says, At present we do not see everything subject to him. He's not yet come back and made everything right again. And that means that the righteous will sometimes get what the wicked deserve. And the wicked will sometimes succeed and thrive. And we will look at this, and we will look at what Scripture says, and we'll say, what is happening here? This is backwards. God, if you're just, then the wicked will get what wicked deserve and the righteous will get what righteous deserve. But at present, we don't see that. So things are not the way they're supposed to be. And so we are going to get angry with God. We're going to get upset. We're going to get frustrated with Him. In this fallen world, the sinless Christ has to die for sinful mortals. Be respectful. Remember who it is that you're talking to. You can rage. You can be angry. You can be frustrated. You can take it out on God. But remember who you're talking to. You're talking to someone who has suffered all of your punishment in your place. And that is His justice. He took what was just upon each of us, upon Himself. Completely unfair, but God's justice. Our Lord and Savior didn't avoid suffering. In fact, He dove into it head first. And what happened on the other side? He came out and He resurrected and He lives now a new life. He's never going to die again. He's got a perfect body now. 
And in him, that is our story too. We come out on the other side of suffering, new people. The God receiving our anger has suffered far more than we ever will. We need to remember who we're talking to. We can be angry, we can be upset, we can even rage against God, but remember who you're talking to. This is the God of justice who took justice upon himself so that we would not get what we deserve. The God who leads through suffering, he has a purpose, and so our suffering is not meaningless. Just as Christ on the cross was certainly not meaningless, our suffering is not meaningless either. In Christ, all suffering is actually redemptive. There's that verse in Romans that's quoted a lot. God works all things for the good of those who love Him, those who are called according to His purpose. If you belong to Christ, your suffering is redemptive. There's a verse in Job where Job is speaking. And he says this, Though He slay me, yet I will hope in Him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. Indeed, this will turn out for my deliverance. Even in the middle of all of this, Job says, this is going to turn out for my deliverance. And in Christ, we can say the same thing. In Christ, believers can say, this will turn out for my deliverance. Because if my Lord and Savior had terrible suffering and that was redemptive, It's going to be redemptive for me too. This will turn out for my deliverance. Let's hold on to that hope even when we are upset with God. And let's bow our heads and pray. Lord our God, as we look around this world, we see a lot of disconnect between your promises and your justice and what actually happens. And Lord, we don't understand this. And Lord, sometimes we are going to be frustrated with you and even angry with you. But Lord, make it so that our anger in these times draws us to you. And Lord, remind us that even though we are upset with you because you do allow things to happen, Lord, you have suffered far more than we have. And Lord, remind us that your justice will prevail and that, Lord, this suffering is redemptive. Please keep that on our minds, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.